anyway, verse 6, Titus chapter 1. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Um, Paul begins to list some of the qualifications necessary to be an elder. Um, notice here that this verse and verse 5 are one sentence. Uh, in a sense, this, this verse uh, 6 is a direct answer to verse 5. You'll notice some they give a um, they give like a uh, you know a little line there to say that you know this is like they're they're just one and the same you know uh, while none of these sort of qualifications are really negotiable in terms of finding an elder um, like in terms of like well we'll just get somebody who's like seven out of ten uh, this this appears to me at least from sort of if you back up and do kind of a paragraph analysis on this. Uh, this appears to be like some of the biggest qualifications an elder must meet. Uh, and certainly that would be uh, historically true uh, for the Cretans, you know, uh, people who were renowned for their debauchery. Um, uh, the, first, the first one is if anyone is above reproach. Being above reproach does not mean uh, that no one will ever uh, level criticism against you. Uh, a good example is the writer of this letter, Paul. Uh, if we were to make uh, like a resume of the things that uh, do, it would be no church uh, in America would hire him. Uh, he was constantly being thrown in prison, beaten, stoned, attacked, dragged before judges, dragged before rulers, and dragged before magistrates. He spent he spent days and nights in the ocean. He was a prisoner, um, just on and on and on. Uh, now this is the important part. None of the charges stuck. All of the lies hurled to Paul were not believable. Uh, and in the case of his trial before Felix and later before uh, Agrippa, Paul had to essentially ask to stay in prison uh, by asking, uh, demanding to go before uh, Caesar as a Roman citizen who was afforded such a privilege. Uh, Paul's record was so clean and his way of life was so different from the world around him, others saw him uh, as beyond reproach, disinterested parties anyway. Uh, uh, you know, there are numerous places where it said that his enemies conspired uh, to try and figure out how to get rid of him. You know, so it wasn't like it was, it was illegal or anything like that. It was just like, well, we have to find a way to get him done. Um, Chris, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Um, I like that point. That was a really cool analogy of uh, of uh, showing Paul as the blameless one and not being – because that actually means like – you know, something that uh, it doesn't stick to you, or like a Teflon Don type of thing. Um, what It literally means <laughs> nothing to take hold upon. Um, I think we all kind of should be, this is just for pastors, really. I mean, um, I think it would be everybody live their life like in the light. I guess what I mean by that is that if anybody, you, you should never have anything in your life that like, you're afraid people will find out or, you know, you'll be ruined or whatever. I think that it's not, I think that a lot of us, you know, had stuff like that in our lives. Um, you know, especially even new Christians, I think are in a process of getting a lot of that stuff worked out. But, um, you know, as their heart is being changed by the Lord, that's kind of where you arrive and you should be arriving to that place. And if, if somebody is, is on, you know, going to be a, uh, in line for a, you know, a pastor or something, they should be further along in the, in the Lord that they are at a place where they are blameless in this sense, not not sinless or anything that has nothing to do with this word. Uh, as we mentioned, it just means nothing to take hold upon. Uh, the other part of this verse says the husband of one wife. And this has a lot of doctrine in, in these things, too. Um, this is a quote from David Guzik. The idea is of a one woman man. And that's actually what it literally means. He says, um, it does not mean that a leader must be married. If that were the case, then both Jesus and Paul would be disqualified from leadership. Uh, nor is it the idea that a leader could never remarry uh, if his wife had passed away or if he were biblically divorced. The idea is that the leader has his focus on one woman, that being his wife. You know, to that I would mention a lot of scholars believe that Paul may have once been married uh, just because there's a, there's a few things that they can tell. First, if he, if he was a Pharisee, 
there was a requirement for Pharisees to have been married, and uh, there's some other like real subtle things. It's certainly not uh, certainly not uh, you know definite, but I think one thing that you can tell uh, to sort of validate Guzik's point there that you don't really have to be married in order to be um, in this position would be in First Corinthians seven verse thirty two where it says, "But I would have you without care carefulness." Uh, and he's talking about you know not being married if you don't have to be married if you can if you can not be married he asks us not to be because he says I would have you without carefulness he that is unmarried careth for the things that be, uh, that belongeth to the Lord how he may please the Lord but he that is married careth for the things that are of the world how he may please his wife granted um, and, and of course he says goes on to say this isn't a bad thing. If anybody marries, he has not sinned. But if anybody doesn't marry, he does does better, basically. Uh, so uh, it's not talking about pastors specifically here, granted. So it's not you shouldn't build that doctrine necessarily about pastors here. But I think the principle is still there. That being uh, uh, said, I think it's a better idea, me personally, for pastors to be married uh, for a ton of you know good reasons. But that's my opinion, and I think that you can... Uh, make a pretty good case out of that. Um, he says also, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly, as the King James puts it. Um, and I wonder about this one. I wonder how many pastors today, like, don't get the job because, you know, their kids are, you know, just awful. <laughs> Probably doesn't come up too much in the, but it might. I mean, I, I don't know. I've never sat in a, I'm, you know, making a pastor making the pastor I, I imagine that's got to be for a vocational pastor that's got to be a very scary exactly thing yeah. <laughs> you know especially because nowadays it seems that children of pastors typically tend to rebel against what their what their parents are about i agree so and i think that there's lots of cases where parents are doing every single thing in the world right but the kid is just rotten um but then again there's something that i think that would make a qualified pastor a person that was really, let's say, really following the Lord, just a great candidate for a pastor. He probably would be have dealt with that in some or you know even unorthodox way. You know, some interesting, creative, prayed a whole lot, whatever it may have been. Uh, and I think that in it does give us a little bit of hint in First Timothy four, which also mentions this qualification for pastors. And in addition, it clarifies the reason why uh, this is this is uh, asked. It says he must manage his ho own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? So, you know, that's a pretty that's a pretty good point. It's hard to argue with that one. Um, and that's all I have for that one. All right, Titus. Chapter 1, verse. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. Paul continued with his list of qualifications here. Uh, of particular note is the fact that he uses a different word here, overseer, as, as uh, Chris talked about earlier. Some would argue that this is a different position than elder. Uh, and I tend to see this as merely a similar term for the same position. Uh, and I get that. Uh, I get that by looking at the whole fact that he seems to be talking about the same thing here in context of the paragraph and uh, in context of his logical thought and just using the words interchangeably. Um, uh, further, it appears that in all the places where Paul uses the term overseer, he tends to mix them with at least one other word uh, describing the same thing. Uh, and again, like I said earlier, well, not a fundamental doctrinal point. Uh, it is important, I guess. Does the text speak of two positions or of one? Uh, as I said, I, on the side of elder overseeing being essentially the same position, uh, at least from the context of the passage here. Uh, again, Paul stresses here that we must be above reproach. Uh, he then goes on to list some of the qualities relating to that. Uh, Paul writes uh, that he must, be not er must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. Uh, in view here is a very is very much the idea of humbleness, uh, of putting others first, uh, all of which stand at odds with being arrogant or quick-tempered. And that's really, that's really uh, not only should they be arrogant, not be arrogant or quick-tempered, 
you're going to likely see somebody who's going to be an overseer slash elder uh, as not arrogant or quick-tempered. Uh, uh, or uh, they're not going to be arrogant or quick-tempered, but they're also going to be humble, um, uh, at least in practical, in a practical sense. Chris? Yeah, um, I think uh, this first part where he, the first part of this verse where he says, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed. I think that all is like one part of one thing there. Um, some commentators mentioned the self-willed part separately, but I think that it's tied to being a, a steward of God. A steward is somebody who manages the house. He's like a general manager of uh, his master's house, including you know the, the financial stuff and all the responsibilities of the house and, and stuff like that. The steward knows that all this stuff that he's managing is not his own, that he's uh, handling uh, it for his master. And therefore, he is not self-willed uh, when it comes to, you know, what's going to happen with his master's house. Uh, his concern uh, is going to be with what, uh, what, what his master wants to be. So I think the self-willed part is tied to him being a steward of God. And I think that, again, this is stuff that doesn't have to be just with a pastor. I mean, how, how, much, how much more should we uh, desire to walk towards being a good steward uh, of God and not self-willed. And I think that one of the obvious ways is financially, I think that we can be stewards of God, recognizing that what we have is not ours, that he's got it for his purposes, and that we can be, you know, we should, every time we spend money, we can we should almost be like, you know, would God be cool with this? You know, this is, this is his money, you know, he gave it to me through the random blessings or whatever. But you know that's um, that's that carries over to everything. How your everything, your life. Uh, it says not soon angry. Now this one is pretty obvious why you it would make it would make a good pastor for him to be really angry because there's probably lots of reasons for a pastor to get really angry already. So not soon angry. Yeah. <laughs> He'll get angry eventually. But um, and this one not given to wine. And this one has caused all kinds of trouble, no doubt. Um, this one is interesting. Some people say that it means not addicted to wine. And Strong's uh, concordance says it means staying near wine, that is, tippling a topper or given to wine. And I don't think that it can mean addicted to wine. Not given to wine means not addicted to wine. I don't think it can mean that because when we see this in First Timothy, we see the... Uh, we see that pastors and deacons have uh, two different requirements, oddly, requirements about wine. The pastor is said uh, not to be given to wine, just like it says here when referring to the same word. But interestingly, the deacon is said not to be given to much wine. So I can hardly think that it means that the deacons can be just a little addicted to wine, <laughs> you know. Um, but rather, I, I think the answer is, uh, and this is just, you know, my feelings, I'm not dogmatic about this in, in any way, I think the answer is that there should not be any regular drinking on the part of a pastor. I don't think that it, yeah, I would go so far as to say that he should never put wine to his lips or anything, but I think that the term given to wine has a definition that is somewhere in the middle, and um, I don't think pastors should be given to wine, as it says here. Um, but this is altogether different from being drunk, which the Bible says all over the place is, is not only not for pastors, but it's n nobody should, should uh, be drunk. Um, again, it, it's uh, one that's pretty obvious. No striker, not given to filthy lucre. So they shouldn't be violent men or greedy men. Both of them are pretty obvious. But, you know, I say obvious, but I, I bet uh, those qualifications were important in a lot of decisions of who would and wouldn't be a pastor in who knows how many congregations from in the last 2,000 years. So uh, I say obvious, but probably not so obvious. I'm sure the Holy, Holy Spirit put it there for a great reason. Uh, Mike? 